Aloha, and welcome to Figments, the Power of Imagination, Season 3, Episode 9, My Arbitrary Numbering System. Got a great episode for you today with two repeat guests, really smart guys. That's how I keep this show afloat, is by getting people smarter than me on it. Um, and before we try to entertain and inspire with the discussion of North Korea, uh, I would like to go on a weekly rant or bi-weekly rant. I'll start each of our shows off this way. Uh, to kind of blend what we did on figments on reality with figments the power of imagination. So you might be able to tell that my initial rant is going to be about what? About the Hawaii mask mandate. All of the other COVID restrictions came off at midnight Saturday, but the mask mandate remains the single least effective method of preventing COVID. So I'd like to paraphrase, paraphrase Ronald Reagan and say, or say Governor Ige, tear off this mask. It's annoying because it's nonsensical. It doesn't have any impact. So there's that. An update on the government scam I revealed last uh, week, talking about my adventures with government. The Hawaii State government offices are reopened today. So that's progress. I'm not sure about Social Security, the Social Security Administration, but if you remember my discussion, <laughs> I'm not making any progress. Uh, I may be on some sort of a blacklist, but I'll keep tilting in the windmill and keep you all posted. And then something that I feel compelled to talk about is uh, Russia, Ukraine, got the TV on in the background and so I can see what other awful things happen there. Um, uh, there are two comments I'd like to make on Russia, Ukraine. One to our government policymakers, military folks. Uh, I guess I, my tendency would be to say shut up, but I can't say that out of respect. So let me say stop oversharing and over explaining. The discussion about the no fly zone is troubling because why are we talking about this in public? Why are we tipping our hand? Why are we taking options off the table? It's, it's like people are compelled to show a picture of their breakfast when they go out to Denny's or IHOP. Just stop, be quiet, and do things both diplomatically and militarily with some sense of secrecy. Yeah, that's it. Secrecy can be a good thing. The other thing I'll say about Russia, Ukraine is it, it, it is kind of an unreal conflict because it's on TV and we have the long buildup coming to a station near you the Russian invasion, um, but it is real. And I want to make it real for all of our viewers because it's because it's so tragic. Uh, even if you just look at the refugees, 1.7 is million is the refugee count today. What does that mean? That means that the Hawaiian Islands where we live would be uninhabited. In fact, plus 300,000. That's more people than live in the entire Hawaiian Islands. If you don't have the good fortune to live here in Hawaii, let me put it in mainland terms and say it's like taking the city of Phoenix, Arizona and emptying it out. And if you've been to Phoenix, I lived there for four years. That's a big town. That many people have been forced from their homes. It's tragic. And uh, I'm not sure where it's going. So... Uh, what can you do about it? Let me tell you, I am uh, a uh, on the advisory board of a charity uh, that calls itself not neutral because they support American um, uh, interests and kind of get an old slide there. But at the bottom, you see Spirit of America. If you Google it, they have a project in Afghanistan. They're bringing non-lethal aid to the country. Uh, they can't help with the evacuations, but they can provide aid. Uh, go to their webpage and please support Spirit of America. Again, I'm an unpaid senior advisor. I believe a lot in what they do, and that's why I'm affiliated with the organization. Okay. Uh, so let's get to the topic at hand, North Korea Part 1, imagining North Korea Part 1, and that means that I want to do this again because these two guests are really smart guys. Let me welcome first Simon Lee, the retired Foreign Service diplomat. You saw him on the 22nd of February. Aloha, Simon. Aloha. Great to and be back. 
Colonel Ed Hawkins, uh, retired Air Force, a great longtime friend, longer than I've known Simon. Um, and uh, an Intel analyst is the best way to describe it. Ed, how are you? Hi, Fig. Hi, Simon. How are you doing? Yeah. Glad to have you both here. So two perspectives. You'll bring two perspectives to the issue of why North Korea is testing missiles. And that this has been kind of lost in the build up to an execution of the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, but it's a, it's a serious business and there's a lot going on. And uh, Simon and Ed, what the question that I'd like to try to answer today is why, why now? What's going on? Because um, Kim Jong-un doesn't have a big bank account and the COVID pandemic has, has even reduced his ability to, to have have funds for the basic needs, which are nuclear weapons, and maybe then feeding the people. So why would he invest in so many missile tests before? I think I knew back in the day um, what the what the reason was, and uh, that that was shown in a slide that I put together. Hopefully, we'll see it right here. Um, back in 2017, 18, uh, when you looked at the tests during the Kim uh, Il Sung and Kim Jong Il era, to me it was clear that they were pursuing capability. It was such a dramatic change. Let me ask first: Does does that historical judgment that I made make sense to you, Ed? What do you think? You're an Intel guy. What do you think he was trying to do back then? Uh, well, I think I think um, back then um, there was there's a li uh, lack of a confidence. I think a little bit of a confidence within uh, the leadership of North Korea. And I remember, you know, one time uh, as an intel analyst uh, trying to uh, predict, you know, when North Korea would show off some of its capabilities mm -hmm. uh, when Table Dong and their uh, late 90s, you know, became a subject of interest. There was uh, speculation that maybe they would parade it to show the world, you know, that now they, now they mm -hmm. have, but it didn't happen. And I think that's an indicator uh, to me at that time, since I had to provide that assessment to the commander, um, that the confidence wasn't still there, you know. Um, uh, they, they're secretive, definitely, but, mm -hmm. Um, they haven't, they hadn't reached that point where they wanted to show that capability. I think as you show on that, um, the chart that you show that as they became confident of their technology, that they displayed it more and more to the world, uh, through parades and other means and firings. And, uh, I think that's one, uh, factor that you, you, you should take a look at is, uh, just a building up of their confidence over time. Yeah, and that's why I called it a re relentless pursuit of capabilities. As you know, Ed and Simon, we may have talked about this. I was in the space business for a few years in the Air Force as the vice commander of Air Force Space Command. And rocket science is, here's a surprise, still rocket science, and it's really hard. And so you, you have to do it to prove it. Um, but now we're at a we're past that. They established credible capability. I think the world would largely agree that they have some nuclear um, capability and some delivery system capability. But now we're seeing a spate of tests, and I've got a list here. I'm not sure it's complete. I might be missing one because it's really hard to find information, and I'm no longer in the secret, secret squirrel loop. But Simon, that's a bunch of tests just this year. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, we, and you used to negotiate with North Koreans, so you understand this as well as anybody. What do you, what's your initial take on why they'd be doing it? Um, touching back a little bit on what Ed mentioned and also what you touched on a little bit as well, Sig, earlier. Uh, is the notion of capabilities. Um, I look at it as, uh, yes, they do have capabilities and they've demonstrated it. Um, and I also do believe that uh, 
North Korea's ballistic missile program and their and the nuclear program are both such that they need to continue development in order for them to reach their desired goal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the big so for in my mind the bigger question is uh, for the last couple of years prior to January why were the tests not conducted I, I think um, I you know just uh, as a frame of reference I had served at the U.S. Embassy in Seoul from 2016 to 2019 and this was at a time what a when time. yeah yeah uh, a crazy time indeed um, you know unprecedented levels of provocations from the DPRK. Um, and I, if, if my memory serves me well, I, I, I think that the consensus uh, among most of, uh, observers in and out of government at the time was that the DPRK was continuing its trajectory of further developing and refining its capabilities. And so uh, what loomed fairly large in my mind uh, these last couple of years was the relative quiet. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, considerable dying down of, of testing. Um, and I, although I don't know if, if I have the means of being absolutely 100% sure, I think uh, the money is on uh, the notion that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact uh, in the DPRK's either ability to conduct uh, further development of its, of its ballistic missile capabilities or its political will to do so. Um, or actually one uh, a little bit of both. But I, in my mind, I think it's uh, a very uh, safe assumption that the COVID-19 pandemic had some type of an impact on the DPRK's willingness to conduct mm-hmm. tests. So then we fast, fast forward in time to 2022, January in particular, and uh, you know, the intervening months. Uh, why now, as, as going back to why your now? original question, why now? Um, in my mind, I believe it's because it is able to, um, and it certainly has stepped up its conversations with Beijing. In all likelihood, it has had some conversations with Moscow. Now, whether this equates to mm. collusion, that's a different story altogether. Um, yeah, there's a fairly active community of North Korea observers, both in and out of government. And among a lot of the chatter that I've been hearing from uh, very experienced analysts uh, is depending on the timing of you know, when North Korea conducts its, its, its missile launches and its tests, it may or may not have um, you know, connections with uh, whatever decisions coming out of, out of, you know, out of the Kremlin. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the last thing that I've seen uh, among uh, some of my uh, some of the an- uh, analysis coming out of some of my friends, uh, you know, uh, in non-government uh, institutions, is that um, that a lot of the tests seem to have been at least timed not to coincide directly with uh, the invasion of Ukraine. So it does, you know, cast doubt on the level to which, um, you know, Pyongyang colluded with Beijing and and, and Moscow, uh, if at all. Um, yeah. But I but I think that there are, are some, uh, you know, useful things to you know think about some data points out of this entire phenomenon. And and one is, um, again, going back to what I said earlier. Uh, why did it wait until January 2022 to break the moratorium and resume testing? And two, um, you know, Pyongyang stayed relatively quiet, of course, uh, you know, around the time of the Winter Olympics, uh, in all likelihood to save some face for Beijing. Um, and then three, uh, you know, at least as far as I know, um, none of the tests have really coincided directly with the invasion of Ukraine. So it casts somewhat of a doubt on, uh, you know, 100% direct collusion or, um, uh, you know, a, a pre, uh, pre-negotiated, pre-rehearsed set of provocations or invasion by the Kremlin and Pyongyang. Yeah, well, Simon, I, I've got to say that I'm all, I've always been very skeptical about the notion of uh, global conspiracies uh, yeah. because it's difficult enough, and we're going to talk in the 
later, later parts of today's episode about decision making in North Korea, but it's hard enough to get agreement in however big or small your circle is sure. to do it. But having said that, uh, I think uh, that whether he was asked to or not, the odds are that Kim Jong-un elected not to mess with the Winter Olympics of his big neighbor and to some degree big brother, China. And, and the, that explains the pause, which to me says it's, it may just be a pause. And in fact, on March 5th, I think it was, we had an, another test. Um, so should so I, I think... Now I'm going to give my assessment. We talked about this, and I don't know that I'm right about this, but it's something I've come to believe over my years of looking at Korea, and Ed, I'll ask you to respond quickly. My view is that part of the motivation is inattention from the United States, which, by the way, is only going to get worse as we're um, so focused on Europe and Russia, Ukraine, uh, that, that when you look at North Korean priorities, certainly not feeding the people, but the, the U.S. plays a central role. We are the, the raison d'etre of their, of their regime, the foundation of the regime's legitimacy, such as it is. We're the big, bad wolf bastards, as they call us in their propaganda, and we need to occasionally be brought into the public eye to justify the uh, suffering, sacrifice, and repression that they go through. And we use the word provocation, but they're not really, uh, uh, because I, we're training a puppy in our house, as, as Ed knows, having met Ace the Wonder Dog. Um, I don't know that they're trying to provoke, but they have to at least get interaction. Ed, what do you think of the notion that the U.S. is, is key to North Korean decision-making, a key consideration, if not the only one? And I'm sure it's not the only one. Yeah, it's that's that's. Uh, I agree with you that that is a big factor, um, and that has a lot to do with it. If I could, I'd Go like ahead. to uh, just uh, dovetail onto that and maybe offer a a slightly different perspective to Simon's, mm -hmm. um, focusing more internally, you know, to North Korea because they do a lot of things uh, internally as well. And maybe we're going to talk about this, but, you know, the decision making uh, parts of the strong parts of North Korea, the, the army, the, uh, the Korean Workers Party and the uh, leadership at the, uh, the very top level that um, there is. And I think I mentioned it to you before, you know, there, there is some competition, if you will, amongst mm -hmm. those to to uh, get the good graces of, of the leader. Um, and the hiatus, although uh, Simon ex uh, explained it very well, that, you know, there was a time if you're, if, you know, during the Trump administration, there was this uh, love fest, right? So uh, four years of a, a policy, which I don't think the military or the, the, the Workers' Party really liked, you know, because mm. uh, this constant... Um, uh, war or, or adversarial relationship with the United States is what drives them. So right. this was an aberration, you know, during that time. And this new uh, push to showcase their missile capabilities, and, and you know, they've showcased a lot. The Including 1960s uh, Polaris missile type submarine launched ballistic, they don't even have a submarine to launch it from, but they, they show it, you know? So mm -hmm. uh, they, they, have, they wanna show this capability and it may also be, and this the perspective that I wanted to offer, is that this is a way for Kim to, to come back in and, and re-ingratiate himself with the military. Interesting. You know, to, to do more launching and show that uh, he is really hard against the United States after this failed four years of this love fest, which I don't think we'll ever get back to again. So yes, that may to, be a part of their calculus as well. Hard to imagine a return to that period. And frankly, I think it's a lost opportunity on the U.S.'s part. Hold these thoughts and we'll talk about who this competition and who is in the competition here in a bit right after I plug the next episode of Figment's The Power of Imagination on the 21st of March. hope to have a good friend of mine who's starting an institute focusing on 
practical policy. Uh, he's going to look initially at, um, at climate change, but really the question is, are we making decisions that can be implemented in our governance? And uh, the thesis is, no, not very much. So what are the reasonable and responsible decisions that can be made? He's got a better story than that. I'm going to save that till he actually agrees to be on because we've kind of talked about it. But please tune in in two weeks, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of other things to talk about in my weekly rant. Okay, so um, Simon and Ed, back to North Korea. Who's in charge was a big question when Kim Jong-un came into power. But to the casual observer, it sure seems like he's in power. You know, he eliminated his uncle, his uh, half brothers got half brother got assassinated. But he's also done a lot of purging and restructuring that uh, solidified his part. But that doesn't mean there aren't organizations, as Ed said. Um, so Simon, it, other than Kim Jong Un. First of all, let me ask you one question to, uh, with a one word answer, and yes. then we'll get to the rest. Does Kim Jong un have absolute power as the dictator of North Korea? Yes um, or no? Uh, my answer to that question is uh, the capital of Nebraska, which is Lincoln. Uh, <laughs> there's your one word. Um, okay. <laughs> does he have absolute power? Uh, I, I do think that it depends somewhat on your definition of absolute power. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, um, but I, I do think that the way the DPRK society and, and its government operate, um, there are different gradations of absolute power. Mm -hmm. um, I think that certainly in the uh, symbolic, um, you know, political sense, he has absolute power. In practical terms, I don't believe he does. That said, uh, the, the degree to which he can exercise power is certainly, I think, undoubtedly, uh, you know, quite um, significant. Um, and I think uh, looking at the various um, organizations in the North Korean government, uh, you know, bear scrutiny, um, and I do believe that they play significant roles in the decision-making process. Um, and then, you know, uh, one, other thing, one, one additional thing we can add to it is with all aspects of, of North Korean decision-making, there is always an external factor as well as an internal factor. Mm -hmm. So what it does, um, it, particularly in, term, in matters of national defense, foreign policy, uh, national security, the DPRK has a tendency to pay very careful attention to how its actions are perceived abroad and most certainly how it is perceived domestically. So in what circles, you know, this, this you don't just go have um, however many tests that were of like nine missiles total, I think it was six tests, nine missiles, if I remember correctly. That's a big deal. That's a program. You got to move assets. You got to spend money when you're trying to, you know, get through another bit of a famine, if there's such a thing. Um, so there are some deliberations about what's the right thing to do. It isn't just Kim coming down and saying, we're going to do this. What body would those deliberations occur in? And it, either Ed or, or Simon, is there, is that in the party? Is it in the, the one of the committees or departments of the party? Is it probably not in their unicameral Supreme People's Assembly. Um, which, office, which office was burning the midnight oil in December to get ready for the, the tests in January? Ed, I'll start with you. Any idea? I don't. <laughs> um, that, that is, that's an area that I, I really haven't focused on. But uh, one, uh, as, I, as I mentioned to you before, you know, I agree with Simon that the capital of Nebraska is Lincoln. Good um, job. But uh, that's that's as far as I can go on figuring out, you know, who makes the decision yeah. where. But but I suspect that as as in any society that has this uh, um, uh, agenda of hatred and animosity towards 
a, a country or people that, uh, you know, I mean, Kim, Kim or his, his uh, family, let's say, they just don't come up and say, well, let's do this. Let's go and kill my half brother. Let's, right. let's uh, shell the Northwest islands with artillery. You know, they, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. don't, I don't think the top person does that. It's these organizations that come with ideas, you know, options on what to do and they're selected, you know? And I, and I think that Kim and his inner circle will be the decision, final decision makers. But I think that's how these programs well up, including the missile test. It has definitely internal um, message as well to the people mm -hmm. here, we're strong. Uh, it also has messages to the countries surrounding them and to the United States, although deterrence wise, you know, several missiles with nuclear weapons, uh, that's not enough. I mean, they, mm -hmm. I, I believe that Kim himself feels that if he started something, uh, he's not mad enough to think that he could get away with that because his country would be destroyed. But uh, mm. I think it's a combination of those things and that the decision-making process uh, is at the top, but these options float up for that particular military, political, and other kinds of things that might go into the picture. And even perhaps, as Simon alluded to, uh, something to do with... Uh, maybe collusion with uh, Russia. Okay, Simon, as we are quickly blew through our 28 minutes, which always happens, it means we have to get you back uh, for part two, uh, hopefully many parts in North Korea sometime soon. Uh, closing thoughts on the decision-making process and more importantly, maybe an assessment. Should we be worried or is this just another cycle of what we like to call provocations? Is this something new or same old, same old? Uh, you know, again, with a, you know, with a very strong caveat that it's, it's impossible to know for sure. Mm -hmm. um, my belief is that this is somewhat of a return to normal. Um, and mm. that the last two years were somewhat of an abnormality that I believe uh, largely resulted, perhaps not 100%, but largely resulted as a, as a side effect of, of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, it's certainly important to pay heed to what happens at the DPRK-China border, um, you know, before and during any uh, missile tests and, and things of that nature by the DPRK. Um, you know, the most noteworthy thing that, that came to mind is that, uh, you know, in the first, you know, couple months of this year, um, the very recent, very, very recent resumption of border trade between DPRK right. and China. Um, and that the, you know, the series of provocations since January more or less appear to have coincided somewhat, you know, with the resumption of the trade. So that's something uh, certainly to look at, which again, so, addresses yeah. what I said earlier about uh, perhaps a return to normal, or perhaps so, a return to the usual. A return to the abnormal normalcy of North Korea. Yeah. That's a great point. And, and so I'd like to wrap up our discussion by saying, how about if next time in four or six weeks when I can get you two back on, because I love this stuff and I get two great guys to discuss it with, maybe we could examine the zero case pandemic COVID in North Korea because they claim to have had zero cases, but the, the effects have been uh, really uh, very deleterious for even North Korea. So you guys willing to come back and do another figment sometime in the reasonable future? Sure, absolutely. Count me in. Uh, great, thanks. It would have been really embarrassing if you'd said hell no on the air. Because <laughs> So I'm glad you didn't. Okay, folks, well, let me remind you that the, the legacy episodes of Figments on Reality are available on YouTube. Get out your phones, take a happy snap of our QR code so that those are playlists on YouTube for both Figments, The Power of Imagination, The Current Show, and Figments on Reality, and I hope you'll check out our legacy episodes. Uh, Figments is brought to you courtesy of ThinkTech Hawaii, and I'd like to thank all the folks at ThinkTech Hawaii, including today's engineer, Eric, for making it possible. 
uh, and you make them possible through your donations. So please be generous in supporting Think Tech Hawaii, the home of Hawaii's citizen journalists. See you in a couple of weeks. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.